I'm just checking the time. Here we go. Okay, so we're in our series, Believers in Action. We're looking at Acts chapter 9. So if you've got a Bible and you want to turn to it, if you've got a, uh, an app or whatever, uh, then please turn to Acts chapter 9. Um, we'll be looking at Paul's conversion. One of my favorite films, and actually the first film that I bought on DVD, even before I had a DVD player. Anyone, do you want to guess what it might be? Forrest, no, it's not Forrest Gump. <laughs> Forrest Gump. No, I'll put you out of your misery. It's The Matrix. One of my favorite films. Now, I don't want to spoil it if you haven't watched it, but the hero of the film is a guy called Neo. The clue is in his name. He's the one. Now, Neo believes that the matrix exists. And he also believes in this mythical guy called Morpheus. But he doesn't know how it works. He doesn't know what it is. He just believes there's something called the matrix. And he meets this guy, Morpheus, they come and find him. And they offer him a choice. Take the blue pill or take the red pill. Now the blue pill is to forget about the matrix and to just go on living. Whereas the red pill opens up his eyes to what's really happening in the world. And what's really happening in this world that humans are being used as batteries to, perform, to produce energy for the machines. Now, just whet your appetite. That's, just, that's in the trailer. It's all in the trailer. I'm not telling you what happens. Now, there isn't some sort of heavenly download or some sort of download that he gets that he gets all the information initially. But once he's out of the matrix, they understand. They get some, they, he gets a download. And all that he can, he, I think it's Kung Fu, he does Kung Fu. Learn Kung Fu and he puts the thing in, ah, I can do Kung Fu. Now what we're looking at this morning is Paul and his sudden conversion. He didn't get some sort of download that all of a sudden became this super apostle. And his sudden conversion wasn't as sudden as we think. So I'm going to take you through the conversion and Paul, an encounter with God. Paul, as he becomes known, goes on to write the majority of the New Testament. It's no accident. He encounters God. He's been seeking God. He has his eyes opened and is converted and his life is transformed. So let's have a look at the passage and then we'll come back to what we've got to say. So Acts chapter nine, verse one. But Saul still breathing out threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus. So he, if he found any belonging to the way, i.e. Christians, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city and you'll be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. They led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. 
and for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus called Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to a street called Straight and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come and lay hands on him that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has the authority from chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that it's not us that finds you but it's you that finds us that you come to us that you reveal yourself to us that you open our eyes that we may see Lord we long for more encounters with you encounters that open our eyes further to help us see more help us understand more help us hear more We want more of you. We want to grow closer to you. Hear more from you, Lord Jesus. So we pray, help us from the story of Paul and speak to us, we pray, in Jesus' name. So I want to talk this account, and we're not going to cover all of it. I just wanted to complete the story so you have the whole account. But I want to talk about, rather than having three points this morning, I'm going to have three people So we're going to talk from three different directions about this account. First one is Saul, the worst of sinners, pre-conversion. Secondly, we're going to talk about Jesus, the God of sovereign grace and conversion. And then thirdly, we're going to talk about Ananias, the ordinary and acceptance. So that's my three headings, my three people for this morning that we're going to talk about briefly so everyone needs conversion even Saul needed conversion he was a religious man very religious he was um, a Pharisee it says in, in Philippians he was a Hebrew of Hebrews he was a man who was religiously zealous for God, for the law. But there was something missing. There was something that got under his skin. Something he didn't like about the church of Christ. And he ravaged the church. It tells us in Acts 8, he ravages the church. He approves of the execution of Stephen. Stands by holding the coats. Luke is, Luke's the writer of, of Acts, same as the book of Luke. And Luke was, went along with Paul, was on, on Paul's missionary journeys later. So we, we believe these accounts because we think that Paul is actually telling Luke. He's telling him what happened. Now it's quite significant. In, there's two other accounts of Paul's conversion in Acts. Paul record, re, retells it himself in Acts 22 and also in 26, we'll refer to those a little bit later. But it's important. This is what Paul says about himself in Acts 26. He says, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, 
as all of you are this day. And he's talking to Jews. I persecuted this way to death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women. As the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness, from them I received letters to the brothers, and I journeyed toward Damascus to take those also who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. There's Paul's summary later of what he intended to do in Damascus. Damascus was quite a long way from Jerusalem, about a week's, a week's journey, taking quite a decent amount of time, about 150 miles, you know, cars, taking about a week. But he went to destroy the church from moving forward. So as we sent out Matthew into uh, Crew and Nantwich and into Chess, actually, uh, the enemy would seek to stop that happening, to stop the church spreading. Try and destroy itself centrally. He says once he's converted some um, remarkable things about himself in his pre uh, Christian days, because he was a Pharisee, deeply religious trying to do the right thing, following the letter of the law. But he calls himself in 1 Timothy 15, and I'll just read through this. 1 Timothy 1, 15 to 17, says, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. So I'm, I'm the worst. I think as it says in, I think it's probably the King James says, I'm the worst of sinners. But I receive mercy for this reason that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who believe, were to believe in him for eternal life. So Paul says, oh, but I was the worst of sinners. I thought I was religious. I thought I was doing everything right. But when I look back now, I see that I was the worst. I sought to destroy the church. The King James translates this passage slightly differently. As an example, it says, or a pattern. Actually, Paul says, my salvation, my conversion is a pattern, is an example for all those who are going to believe. We might think it was a sudden thing. A flash of lightning on a road. But actually, there was a process going on in Paul's life. So what of Jesus? Jesus, the second person in our account, the God of sovereign grace who brings conversion. He's the most remarkable person in this thing, in this account, in this world. He's not only died to save Paul, who's rejected him and seeking to kill his followers. But actually, Jesus encounters him and says, you're persecuting me. We'll come back to that in a moment. So what do we think? Is Saul's conversion typical? We say, well, my conversion wasn't like that. I didn't get a light flashing on the road. I didn't have an encounter with Jesus when he spoke to me audibly. I haven't done any of that. If I'd had that, I'd have come to faith. I'd, have be, I'd be just like Paul. Because that's the question, isn't it? Why don't we live like Paul? Why aren't we seeking to travel around, preaching the gospel, seeing people healed, caring for folk, being content in life? Paul says, it in, I'm content. I know how to be content. Whether I have a lot or I have a little, I'm content. There was something that changed in Paul and it changed at this point in his life. But there was a lot of things that went ahead and a lot of things that come after. What happens with this first encounter? Because there's three things, three parts of this conversion that come and we're going to cover them quickly. But it's this sense of there's, a, there's an encounter with God that his eyes are open up because Jesus comes and does these things. Jesus comes, we need, to encounter, we need to encounter Jesus because Jesus opens spiritual eyes. As, uh, Sylvia brought last week talking about spiritual sight. 
And then finally, conversion is the end of a process. So what about this first encounter? Well, there's a bright light, it says, in this passage, blinding him and knocking him to the ground. We don't know. He may have been riding a horse. doesn't tell us in the Bible. Often we have pictures where he was knocked off his horse. We don't know that. And the voice speaks to him with a question. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So why does he say his name twice? Well, it was a, a form of infection. Saul, Saul, son, son, why are you persecuting me? But is Paul having a hallucination? Is Paul seeing things? Is he hearing things that no one else can hear or see? Well, the, the account tells us not that the others heard the voice too that saw the light. If we look at the other uh, passages, if, look at, if you looked at Acts 22, and I encourage you to read these other accounts. If we look at Acts 22, verse 6, it said it was, it was noon. So this light is shining. It's not like a light in the night. This is the brightest part of the day, and the light is brighter still. Brighter than the noonday sun. This is the glory of God. In Acts 26, it says, the men saw it too. They all saw this light. And actually, it wasn't just that the light blinded Paul because the other men are able to lead him into Damascus. So there's something else going on here. There's something else happening. But these men, these are witnesses. If you're looking for facts about faith, facts about why I should believe, then here's some facts here. Actually, if, if this had been a story that Paul had made up, these guys say, well, hey, no, that never happened. Because we, we don't assume these guys are, are, are part of the, um, the Jewish faith, whether they're Jews or not, we don't know. It tells us later, actually, they didn't understand the Hebrew, so maybe they weren't. But they were certainly part of that. Uh, they were part of a, a guard, that were going to take people back from Damascus to, to Jerusalem. So presumably there were some guards involved with that. Maybe they weren't uh, learned men. But they would have challenged Paul. There was a lot of opposition against the church, as we know at this time. They would have challenged this story, this account, because this has been written about 20 years later. It tells us in Acts 22, also the ones that saw the light, but they didn't understand the voice of the one speaking. So they, they saw the light, they heard the voice, but they didn't understand it. They didn't understand what it said. Paul tells us in Acts 26 that they, he spoke, the voice spoke in Hebrew and spoke to Paul, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Paul is not completely overwhelmed because he's got his wits about him enough to say, who are you, Lord? Who are you? I thought I was on the right side. I thought I was doing the right things. He acknowledges that this is a power beyond what he thinks. And he tell, Jesus tells him, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. We see in other things, actually, the encounter does go on longer, and Paul asks other questions. He said, what shall I do? What shall I do? Because he's blind. You blind? You know what to do? Have you come to faith? Because here there's three different sorts of people in one way. We've got those who are converted, who have come to faith. We've got those who haven't been converted yet. And we've got those who think they're converted. Have you had that encounter with God? Have you had your eyes open? Or are you like Paul, living a religious life, following the rules, seeking to follow rules, but actually not ever encountering God? Having your eyes open to the truth, revelation to who God really is and his power. This is what Jesus says to him. He says, rise, this is in Acts 22, verse 10. Rise and go into the city and you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. 
And they said, then since I was unable to see, I was led by the hand by those with me into Damascus. And then in Acts 26, we get a little bit more. Jesus says, actually, he says, for I've appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things that you've seen in me, to those in which I appear to you, delivering you from those people and from the Gentiles, to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. There's your summary of the gospel right there. To open eyes, turning from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, to receive forgiveness of sins and a place with the saints, Jesus' family. Amen? So Paul has encountered God. He's been stopped in his tracks. He's had his eyes open to something that he's never realized. He's experienced God, but he's seen something. Now he wonders. Now he wonders. But this is the end of a process for Paul. Why is Paul so anti-church? Why is he so anti-Jesus? Well, because he was under his skin. He didn't like the way they were peaceful. He didn't like the way they were satisfied. He didn't like the the, uh, intimacy they had with God that he didn't have. He had knowledge. He had practice. He kept the rules. But he didn't have engagement with God. But he wanted it. The Jews wanted that so much and they thought they would find it by keeping the rules. Strange religious practices. Actually, in verse 14 of 26, he says, gives us a, a, a description. I don't know if you've, you've understood what this means. I haven't only recently. It says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Anyone know what a goad is? I know Graham does because I spoke to him. What's a goad? You think, well, you, you've probably read it. And you think, well, okay. I'm trying to understand what that means. You know what a, a goad is? Basically a cattle prod. It was used by shepherds for livestock, well, and also other cattle, to keep them in order, to keep them going in the right direction. So if they're about to fall off a cliff, they'd poke them with a sharp stick. That's a goad. It'd goad you into direction. And actually, Jesus and God have been goading Paul for a while, poking him with a sharp stick, and he didn't like it. Now, there's goads in all our lives, and we all come to salvation because of a process of things happening in our lives often, and they're, they're often God's goads. You don't look convinced. I know I had lots of sharp sticks when I was coming to faith. Let's talk about what are the goads in Paul's life, just so you can see that there's some evidence of that. Paul certainly had doubts. Who is this Jesus? Didn't like him. If we look back to the, some of the passages we read, they say, if this guy is not of God, they'll just disperse. But he, they didn't disperse. They got stronger. They got stronger, and they saw amazing things happen. That's got to put doubts in your mind. We've got to destroy these guys. These guys are going to take our positions. I, I've, I've, I've set up, I've set my life to be a Pharisee. I want to be, you know, I'm sure Paul had, you know, ideas about being a high priest. Maybe I don't know what was in his heart, but he wanted to go ahead. He, he was ambitious, it tells us in other parts of the Bible. But he had these goats. He, de- he may have met Jesus. I'm pretty sure he probably did in the synagogue or in the temple at some time because Paul was, he was a religious nut. He was there, he was around. Jesus coming and teaching would have listened. Oh wow, what is this teaching? But definitely heard about him. Now Stephen, he was also a goad in Paul's life. And we know he met Stephen and we heard Stephen's eloquent, eloquent preach. We're pretty sure, that me, not me, the commentators and the people that do all the more study than I do, a lot more study, understanding things. So actually, the, the preach that we have of Stephen is probably written by Paul. Paul probably is a, recounting that for Luke. 
to write, because Luke wasn't there. Luke collects the accounts from other people. So this is pretty much coming from Paul. So Paul remembers the details. This, this had an impact on him. But what had a greater impact on after this speech, and people are about to stone him, Stephen's face is like an angel. You know, and you can imagine Paul telling Luke, his face was like an angel. I couldn't believe it. His man was about to die, and yet he was full of peace. And you can imagine it, Paul, I want that peace. I haven't got peace. I just need to follow these rules. We need to make sure I follow all the rules. But he wanted peace. And Stephen had peace. The third goad in Paul's life was the law and morality. Philippians 3 verse 6 said he was legalistically faultless and yet his conscience had now been disturbed. I say externally he kept the rules but his thoughts and desires were not pure. How do we know that? Because it tells us, it's in Romans 7, he tells us he coveted in his heart. How does he know to covet? How did he know what covets in him? Well, he tells us, he says, I would, have, I would not have known it if the law didn't say it. So the law is a goad. It's a goad to all of us. I'm not right. I'm not following the law. You see the Ten Commandments thing as the goads in our life because it's like, it says it provokes sin. It uncovers sin, but it also provokes sin. You say, ah, and we with that example of, you know, you see a sign that says, do not walk on the grass, and immediately you want to walk on the grass. You didn't want to walk on the grass before you saw the sign. Why shouldn't I walk on the grass? Well, it's the same with the law. It comes as a go. Why? Cover? I didn't know I was coveting. I just thought, I really like my neighbor's car, and I'd really want one. And he left his lights on last night. Now he's not caring for his car well enough. <laughs> it's what John Stott says. So we too can and must experience a personal encounter with Jesus Christ, surrender to him in repentance and faith, and receive summons to service. We need an encounter with God. We need to respond in repentance and faith and receive a summons to service. Actually, conversion and becoming a Christian isn't just adding Jesus to your already busy life. Saying, yeah, I've added Jesus. It's an app I've added on my phone, the Jesus app. You know, I've had to, you might have to remove a few things sometimes, but we just get, actually now phones just get bigger and bigger memory. I don't have to delete anything anymore. Just keep adding them. Just keep adding those apps. But we can do that with Jesus. We just add him on as an add-on extra. Hey, Jesus, I'm coming this way. You come with me. Hey, that's not how it works. Jesus says, no, you come and follow me. You turn around. You come my direction. You're coming with me. It's not me coming with you. Jesus wants a complete conversion, complete change in your life. Do we all need a Damascus Road experience? A lightning flash? Falling to the ground, hearing an audible voice? Perhaps in Aramaic to make it all the more authentic? Do we need to be on a road near Damascus in order for God to speak to us? No, we don't, do we? But we do need this process. We do need to encounter God. We do need our eyes opened. We do need to realize actually God is goading us and coming to us and saying, come on, I want you. Come and follow me. Finally, I talk about Ananias the ordinary. As Saul enters Damascus, led by the hand, he commits himself to pray. He tells us, the Bible tells us that he prays for three days and he's fasting. What do you think he's praying? It's my question. What, what was Paul praying? 
Forgiveness? Was he praying for forgiveness from his past? Forgiveness for what he'd done? He's playing wisdom for the future? Or was he worshipping in the now and saying, God, so grateful. So grateful for your mercy that you would save me a sinner. And Paul, this is why Paul expressed his heart in eight, Romans 8, 15. It says, for did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back again into fear. But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Hey, Paul's engages. I mean, we don't know. I'm not saying he got this then, but I'm saying that's the, the truth that we come into. We come into a truth that God is Father. Abba, Father. He's close, he's loving, he's full of grace. He's not there with a big stick and a list of all the things that you've done wrong. It's a loving father. But at the same time Paul's praying, God speaks to an ordinary guy called Ananias. Any ordinary people here? I'm ordinary. <laughs> I'm very ordinary. But God does something with Ananias that's absolutely extraordinary. This man is not just, you know, this is tough. You can imagine. There's this guy coming to town. He's called Saul, Ananias. He was there at the stoning of Stephen. He's arresting Christians day by day. He's going into their homes. He's dragging them out, taking them to the chief priests. They're locking them in jail. They've beaten the disciples. He's coming here to Damascus, Ananias. He's coming here. He's after us. Ananias, I'm, gonna, I'm staying here. I'm staying here. Faithful. Courageous. Brave. You brave in your situation? It might be quite straightforward. But God has put you in a place. You're staying where God has put you. You're faithful in what God has given you. You're obedient to what God is saying to you. Ananias expresses some doubt, doesn't he? Say, hang on, God. I mean, it's, God's happy to, to engage in dialogue with us. That's what prayer is, dialogue. We pray, he speaks. We speak, he prays. Well, that's not quite right, is it? Prayer is communication. We think, oh, we need to speak in a special language. No, it's just talking. Dialoguing with God. God says, he's my chosen instrument. Whether the dialogue went further, you think, really? Saul? Tarsus? You know, it's like saying, Graham? Bebbington? My chosen instrument? Really? Are you mad, God? Yes, I am. I'm using him. Now we're all in that situation. We think, use me? Now those of you who are Christians, actually, God calls you Me? What can I bring? Yes, you. Or perhaps you look around and think, why is God using him? Why is he not using me? Well, it's God's choice. Sovereign choice of God. We don't understand sometimes. We don't understand the mystery of what God does and why he chooses some. Gives us, but we have to just obey what God has put on our hearts. So Ananias obeys. William Barclay calls him the forgotten hero. He goes to Saul. Surely, like, he's almost thinking, well, I'm I'm believing this is a prompting from God. He's spoken to me, I'm going to go. But it's almost like walking into the police and saying, I've I've committed this offence that you're looking for people for. And he goes, and he finds Saul praying. And he lays hands on him. Hands for the Holy Spirit hands that are gentle, hands that are accepting. Because he's saying, and he calls him Brother Saul. Brother Saul. There's acceptance. Acceptance of someone who wanted to kill him. Acceptance of someone who might have killed his friends, arrested his friend. But he receives and accepts him. What are you accepting from God? Are you accepting what God's put in your life? 
Are you accepting the challenges, the promptings that God gives you? Are you accepting the people that are around you? As much as you don't agree with them or you're upset about what they've done in the past or what they've said, are you still able to accept them because God has asked you to accept them and to encourage them and welcome them? Because that's the call of the gospel. To accept those who are not like you. This is what he says. He continues, The Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately some like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. And taking food, he was strengthened. Paul's eyes are now completely open. Spiritually and physically. He can see. He can see what he's done. He can see that God has called him. He can see that as a job to be done. He can see what he's going to do in the future. Can you see? Can you see what God wants you? Have you opened your eyes? you allowed God to open your eyes? Are you encountering God on a daily basis? Are you asking him? Are you in a process? Because we're all in a process, even when we come to faith, process of becoming more like Jesus. So why don't we live like Saul? Why don't we live? Why do we feel like we're not getting it right sometimes? You know why? And this, you know, I'll just acknowledge um, just Tim Keller at this point and encouraged by what he's written on this. He says, because we have forgotten who we are. Have you forgotten who you are? Have you forgotten the call on your life? Have you forgotten who you are in? He says, we are in Christ. And Christ stands up for you. He says, doesn't he say it's to Saul? He says, why are you persecuting me? And Saul's going, I haven't persecuted you, Lord. I persecuted these pesky Christians. Well, Jesus <coughs> accepts those pesky Christians as himself and says, why are you persecuting me? Jesus receives us like that so we can receive others. Have you been received? This is what Tim Keller says. The gospel says you are more simple and flawed than you ever dared believe, but more accepted and loved than you ever dared hope. How amazing is that? God accepts us more than we can hope. We haven't got it all right, but we're in a process coming to God. Conversion is a complete change, not just an add-on. It's following Jesus. We must die to self and live for him. Amen.